Hello and welcome to the Woodshed Podcast. I'm Aaron Tornberg and we are here. We are back. We uh, have taken a break since the last episode, which I think was sometime around April. And uh, we are now back to continue. And I'm here today with Pam Steinfeld. And uh, she is going to be uh, our guest and sing some songs, tell some tales, all that good stuff. So, as always, I talk about the Greenville Junction Shop uh, when we do the show. They're our sponsor, and they're very generous with us. The Greenville Junction Shop is actually opening almost in downtown Greenville very soon. So we're going to keep an eye on that. And so you know, the Greenville Junction Shop is a secondhand shop. They have pre-used items, uh, so they they get all warmed up for you so you can use them. And they are going to be open as an actual physical location in Greenville. And they have all kinds of stuff. They have household appliances. They have furniture. They have electronics and records, whatever, Um, posters, all kinds of cool things. So if you want to check them out, they are um, in Greenville, New Hampshire, and their website uh, they don't have, but check them out on Facebook. They they took the website down for further work, uh, but check out Facebook, Greenville Junction Shop. That's Greenville, G-R-E-E-N-V-I-L-L-E, Junction, J-U-N-K-T-I-O-N. Don't mess that up. That That's the difference. And it's Greenville Junction Shoppy, S-H-O-P-P-E, the old spelling of Shoppy. So, um, all right, and that's about it for the intro. So, Pamela, you are here. Do you like to be called Pamela more or Pam? I do like to be called Pamela, but um, <laughs> it never happens. <laughs> okay. So, so Pam's fine. How about if I, I just make all your dreams come true and call you Pamela today? That would be awesome. Okay, I'll do that. <laughs> Great day. Okay, so Pamela, do you yes. uh, you want to tell us where you're from? Sure. I'm from New Jersey, um, kind of mid-state, about 45 minutes from New York. And um, anything more than that? I, I went to college up here and um, I okay. love it up here. Did not go back to Jersey. Yeah, so you you just came to college and said I gotta stay over in this area because it's it's really nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've awesome. I've been to New Jersey. Um, it's got nice parts. Mm-hmm. Um, wh- where did you live there? In Watchung, uh, okay. in Watchung and Westfield, actually, and um, with my two sisters and mom and dad, and uh, you know, came to college in Massachusetts and. Um, I fell in love with the place. Where'd you go? I went to Tufts. Oh, okay. Yeah. I used to hang out in Davis Square a lot. That's nice. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Davis Square is gorgeous now. Yeah. They had an awesome bookstore, McIntyre and Sons. I used to spend hours in there. Um, oh, yeah? Yeah. They were great. Um, but they, you know, like all bookstores that are small and used, they kind of shut down and went online. Yeah. Oh, well. But... Uh, We're here to talk about happier things. So, absolutely. How about um, you tell me where you get your music from? Where did you get started with it? Um, I, I, I'm not sure. I I have an answer for that. I can tell you, I started when I was about eight. Um, I my parents gave me piano lessons when I was seven, so. you know, that must have given me some foundation. And I took four years of a piano, most of which was classical. And, um, but then I had a teacher who taught me some chords. And then I was kind of off. And I just fell in love with it. And started write, writing my own songs. And either, you know, either starting with the music first or starting with lyrics. All different ways of coming up with songs and and you know kept <laughs> I think I still have them like five big spiral notebooks um, you know with with the beginning of every song taped to a page 
I, I actually have I had one of those. I ended up throwing it away eventually. I, it was like, I can put it all on computer and then I'll never lose it. So yeah, 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 yeah. But for for nostalgic purposes, I, I should have kept it. But well, it's funny. I, I did look at some of them a few years ago, and I just thought, well, I hope these never see the light of day. You know, <laughs> <laughs> some of them, yeah. So um, what what were yeah. you? Um, doing for writing songs to begin with did you start writing on piano to begin or did you get guitar and then start writing that way oh no it was it was piano based but um more often than not and this is still true i start with lyrics and you know write either an entire song or you know one verse in a chorus or even just a few lines and um, and then go to the, well, there are a lot of different ways. I sometimes go to the piano and look for a melody, just, just improvising all the mm-hmm. time. I improvise all the time. So every time you've heard me, Aaron, I'm improvising. Oh, wow. Um, and, and that, that enables me to, um, find melodies that I might like. And what I have always done is had a little tape recorder. I still have those a, a micro cassette recorder, which thankfully they they still make. I, I, <laughs> I know <have>. those. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not kidding. I have a hundred of those little baby tapes, um, and so I would would record whatever I was improvising because so much of it was not deliberate, you know. And eventually, I'd hear something that I liked. I go, oh. I like that. I'm so glad it's recorded. Yeah. And then I could you know, go back to it. So so those were um those were one way of doing it and then another way is just singing. I would you know, anywhere in the house, I would have my lyrics and I would just start singing various melodies to the words and recording again mm-hmm. to to catch that moment when I found something I liked. Now, um, you, when did you start writing songs? I, I think it was eight. It may have been seven, but really? I, wow. I always say eight. <laughs> That's pretty early. I um, know. And uh, so you usually do it on piano, but do you, um, do you force yourself to write every day, or are you just waiting for the inspiration and then you come up with something? Well, that is a really good question. Um, First, I should say, I do write on guitar, or for guitar, Mm -hmm. which I picked up when I was about 14. Um, But I, I, before I had my son, which was 22 years ago, I would wait for that inspiration. And and the interesting thing is, or I think is interesting, I would feel chills down my back, and I would go, oh my gosh, I have a song in me, you know, and then um, would sit down and, and work on it. But, you know, with the arrival of my son and having no time to myself, basically, I would make sure that during any downtime, I would sit down and, you know, quickly focus and work on music or the words because the time was so precious. Mm-hmm. And, um, and and at this point, well, during COVID, of course, I, I do write every day mm-hmm. and because uh, I have the luxury of it, and it's it's very rewarding. Mm-hmm. So you you did a lot of um, playing around. It seems uh, based on your biography that I read, um, you you recorded how many albums have you done? Just just one. Just one. Just okay. one. Yep. And um, then you know you got a lot of people who really like it um, mm-hmm. that I was reading about, but the. Um, when you when you were uh, doing that, were you playing out a lot? Like, did you try to push your album or anything like that? I did. That that's exactly what happened. Um, I wound up spending sixteen years in Washington D.C. Um, I was married, and and that's where we lived. Mm-hmm. But um, and so that's where the CD was made. And even though I'm well, I, w- I had a lot of stage fright at that point, which was about 2001. Um, but I had made this, you know, CD and spent a fair amount of money on it. 
and felt like I should really recoup some of that. So uh, I tried to just say, you know, stage fright is not going to be an issue because it can't be. Right. And I started promoting it to venues and radio stations and newspapers. And it's this interesting little dynamic. You know, when you play somewhere, you can tell the newspaper, this is where I played. And so then they cover you. And then, um, you know, a radio station, you tell a radio station, look, I appeared in this newspaper. Then they want to hear you or interview you. So, right. um, so that's a very long-winded answer. Well, you you have a lot of background in that, though, You because um, you now have your own company doing promotion and, and marketing, right? Yes, yes. Okay. But but it really started with the music mm-hmm. because I, um, I just learned on the job. I really had to promote the CD and my performances. And so I learned all about radio promotion and obviously publicity to newspapers, which were a big thing in those days. Right. And um, and contacting venues and promoters and developing a press kit and having press releases for my CD release concert. And mm-hmm. um, that's that's really where I learned it all. Now, do you currently have a website? I have a website for my PR business, which is okay. called Steinfeld Communications. So it's Steinfeld Communications dot com. OK. Yeah. And people can go there if they want some help doing their music promotion, because that's something people listening might want, you know. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. They get a discount if they mention the podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I I promote um, all different kinds of organizations, Um, regular for-profit businesses, as well as non-profit I've done work for the government, um, federal government, and um, and of course individual musicians, which is which is really fun. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting because I've tried to promote and I've tried to do what you were doing, but you you seem to be very successful at it. What it, what did you do to become successful at it like that? Um, well, first let me ask you: uh, when you say successful, you mean mentioned mentions in newspapers and radio play or do you mean gigs i mean getting jobs doing promotion like you you were good at it obviously oh oh so what what made you passionate about it and how did you get involved with that um well i i really wanted to be successful as a singer songwriter uh you know, obviously, I've been writing songs since I was a kid. I love it. And um, so I was highly, highly motivated. And so I wasn't afraid to call people and send them emails and say, here's my CD. And another thing that really helped, well, just to finish that thought, um, you know, I, I, I had... I made sure that my press kit was very professional mm-hmm. and, and the CD is, is well produced as well. And the more radio play or the more, the more gigs I got, the more prestigious gigs I got, you know, I added to my bio. So, mm-hmm. you know, a buzz starts to create. Um, one thing that was, I, I think probably pretty helpful was um, I I got a lot of um, songwriting awards in for you know like from Billboard magazine their con- their song contest, um, the Mid Atlantic Song Contest, and a few others. And so, um, I I only won one, but you know the others were like honorable mention and that sort of thing. And but you know you put that all in your bio, and it, it's a third person saying, "Hey, you should listen to this." Mm-hmm. You know, so I didn't have to necessarily tout my own, the value of my own music. I had third parties um, do it. And and I mm-hmm. also do think it helped that um, I had uh, two, three members of Mary Chapin Carpenter's band on my CD. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was really wonderful. So is that an influence of yours? Uh, like, 
sort of country or modern country? I wouldn't say country. I really, no, definitely not country. But um, I think it's it's more folk rock or folk pop. Um, and I love ballads as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Mary Chapin is just a fabulous writer. And I have, I think, all of her CDs. Right. Um, you know, and, and followed her a great deal. And met her once, interestingly, just by happenstance. Um yeah, I mean, you know, I think, I think what she conveyed in her records was something I was hoping to convey the the general sound, um, and I I did I knew they were great musicians, so I approached each one, mm-hmm. John Carroll on piano, um, Robbie Magruder on drums, and I think it was J T Bell on bass, and so I just um, you know approached them by email or phone and said, let me send you my songs and see if you would be interested in playing on my, you know my CD. Mhm. So did you uh work for Mary Chapin Carpenter promoting her stuff too? Oh no, no. <laughs> no. You didn't <laughs> no, get that gig. <laughs> she had big time promotion, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Of course she you know she was national. She had you know a major label and they certainly have very good promotion departments. Right. <laughs> well, you know, it was worth a try. <laughs> um, but uh, so you have a lot of different clients, but do you still work with musicians promoting their stuff? I I do when it comes up, and um, you know, frankly, a lot of it's just for free. Like John Gorker was appearing in in my hometown, mm-hmm. well, well, my current hometown, um, not New Jersey, in in Needham. And um, since I'm a huge fan of, fan of his, I I drafted a a piece for the newspaper, and it garnered a lot of attention. And and he had a sold out show, which you know it's not that hard for John Gorka. But um, you know I, I do a lot of that kind of thing for free. Okay, great. And um, what what do you do? Uh... In terms of the promotion, like what what kinds of businesses do you work with then, typically? Like what's the, the best um, ones? I worked with the Refugee Relief Organization, which was super, extremely rewarding, um, that literally airlifted people out of war-torn areas hmm. in Africa. Um, and I, I had the opportunity to work with Kitty Dukakis on a speech she gave um, for a fundraiser for the organization. Um, I've worked for Colony Home Improvement, which is a great uh, remodeling company. Um, Progressive Needham. I, and I've recently worked for the Sudbury Health Department. Um, I know the, the head of the department. He's my neighbor. I've known him for years. And, um, and when COVID hit, he said, we, you know, he just called up, I think, I think he sent me a message at 630 in the morning. We want to hire you. <laughs> okay. I said, okay. That, that sounds good. Um, so I, I did work on their social media, you know, obviously getting the latest research findings out to the general public. Mm-hmm. Um, I analyzed their website. I helped write a presentation for the selectmen. Um and, and wrote pieces for the website. So cool. Those are some examples. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah, it was very rewarding. And then you got the music as well, so you got your artistic outlet at the same time. Yeah, so. yeah, exactly. Um, so are you working on a new album anytime in the future, or are you, you just wanted the one? Oh, no, I'd love to do a second one. Mm-hmm. You know, I have, I have lots of songs, and... I haven't figured out exactly how it would be produced. It, I'm pretty sure it wouldn't be a full blown band, you know, mm. type uh, CD. And I, I really haven't figured out the technical aspects. I know I have a 24 track at home, but you know, I could probably only lay down basic tracks on that, and then ultimately I'd go into a studio. There is a studio in Newburyport that I use for. For some song, for recording some songs after the CD came out, mm-hmm. um, but but I do plan on it. I just oh, haven't cool. figured out. Yeah. 
and I know you're at the open mics a lot um, mm-hmm. and performing at – you perform at uh, like Eagle's Nest and st- – didn't you do that or no? No, I didn't. I, um, I actually haven't promoted my own music that much. I just don't really care about promoting it. I, I, what I love more than anything is the writing. Mm-hmm. So, um, and probably coming in second would be the community, the music community. So I love getting together with all you guys right. at the open mics and getting to know people and their music. And it just seems like the most down to earth way of actually getting to know people. Yeah. So for me, it's the, you know, it's still the creative process and, and the camaraderie, the connection to other people. But I, I just don't really feel compelled to um, to do a lot of performing outside of that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, when COVID's over, you know, maybe maybe I'll do a house concert or something. But it, it, it's not the main focus. Or the hearing room when we're open again. Or the hearing room. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we will be open again. <laughs> I know. I know. We're not and, quite open yet, but. I, I feel so lucky to have discovered the hearing room. I uh, I can't believe how many talented musicians are there and and really sweet people and, and how many activities there are relating to music and songwriting and performing. And um, I, I feel really lucky that I stumbled upon it. Well, we're glad you're there. So. <laughs> Thanks. So... Um, what uh, what's a song you you'd like to play? Is there something sure you'd like to to play for us? Yeah. Um, why don't I play? I think maybe maybe I'll play piano first. Okay. Um, okay. So this is my song called "You Are Mine," and um, written about uh, an old boyfriend. And I'll let you hear it (laughs) for yourself. Looking in your 
cute. Okay. So, um, that was a boyfriend who, um, you, you were in love with and he left and that, that was, or was this your husband or? Um, was that no, it, it was, it was an old boyfriend and we, we mutually agreed to part. Um, but you know, it still has a special, he still has a special place in my heart and, um, you know, I, I appreciate a lot about him and you know, so occasionally I think about him and I thought I'd write a song about that it sort of sounded like a little bit of Carly Simon in there um, is that an influence of yours she is actually yeah. um, <clears throat> that's funny she is I love her songs um, I, I never had anybody say you sound like Carly Simon but that's good <laughs> yeah that that's, that one did for sure that, that works oh good good yeah, I, I, listen, I listen to a lot of Carly Simon, a ton of Joni Mitchell, James Taylor, and a little Carol King, probably, mm. growing up. They all uh, they all come through. So, oh, oh, good. Yeah. Oh, that's good. It sounds good. good. Um, do you have another one you want to do while you're there at the piano? Sure. Um, this is... Uh, this is called Change Your Mind. Mm -hmm. Pretty new one. Okay, this, um, unlike most of my songs, this is not autobiographical. It just, just came to me and I went with it. But uh, I, I, I think it works. So okay. here it is. that um for which the music came first basically and i was just fiddling around on the piano and i i don't know if you you've probably heard of dummy lyrics you know when you're working on a melody sometimes you throw in like la 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 or right open the door or you know 
you know, where's the chair, all kinds of weird lyrics just to just have something to sing. And so I found really the whole melody and had it recorded and I just started singing and I, you know, didn't know what was going to come out, but those were the words that largely came out. And I said, yeah, I think that works. It sounds like a, um, honey, you done me wrong song. Yeah. So, so, uh, <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, so you went to Tufts, you said, um, what did you yeah. do in college? What was your, uh, interest? I studied economics, oh. which, um, never made sense to anyone, including me, <laughs> uh, <laughs> because, you know, I'm kind of, I, I do a lot of writing and obviously I do music. Um, and I realized just, just a couple of years ago that, um, I probably majored in it because it was so interesting. I really like learning about new subject areas. I'm, I'm, I have to like drag myself off of the computer cause I just start researching things that I have the slightest interest in like, Oh, I wonder how that happened. Or I wonder what this means. And, um, and I, I think that was the basis for my majoring in economics. It was nothing I had any experience with and it, it was just kind of fascinating to me. So is economics more of a macro approach to how economic systems work or is it more practical? Well, at, um, at Tufts, it was both. You had to, um, you took my macro courses and micro. So macro deals with, you know, obviously federal spending and, and, um, consumer market baskets and that sort of thing. And then, and then we also learned about micro, um, you know, analyzing the costs of, of producing something and all that goes into that, mm -hmm. that total. So it, yeah. it, it doesn't sound interesting as, as I speak about it, but I do, I do think it really helped me to understand um, the business world a lot better. Yeah. Well, so it was useful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I can see where it's interesting to, to study systems like that mm -hmm. um, and how they work and, and why. So, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And that's really everything you do. You know, anything you do, you want to know why. Um, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that, that's how I am. I, I've been told, I was told by someone that I was the most curious person they had ever met. And I don't think it was a compliment, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would take uh, it as a compliment, but that's me. <laughs> but, but it is true. I am pretty curious. Um, so you, uh, you got married and you were doing, um, that was after college and then you just started doing music full time or did you have another job you were working on then? Well, I was, um, basically I went to Washington to see if I wanted to get married and decided I did <laughs> mm -hmm. to this person and, um, and I was doing PR at the time, and I, but I was submitting my songs to some song contests and, and doing pretty well. And my husband said, you know, why don't you take a couple of years off from PR, um, you know, and see if you can make a go of this, which was very, very generous. And I said, sure. <laughs> you know, I didn't right. have to be asked twice. Um, and... So, I, you know, I proceeded to spend a lot of time writing songs. And then ultimately, um, I, the way it was working at that time is I was pitching them. I was trying to get other people to sing them. You know, mm -hmm. Obviously, well-known artists. <clears throat> and then I, excuse me, I had a meeting with Mary Chapin Carpenter's attorney, who was just a local guy. I mean, he's he was her attorney, so he's obviously really good. But he was just one of the people in a very vibrant music community. So it wasn't a big deal. And I, I showed him or played for him a few demos and said, you know, what do you think you can do with these? And he said, actually, I think you ought to make a CD. Mm. And I'm like, oh, you know, that had never occurred to me, but, I, but he said, yeah, you know, you can sing and you can play. So why don't you make a CD? It, it also gives a, a lot more legitimacy to the songwriting so I said, okay. And, um, you know, 11 and a half months later on 
60 hour weeks I, I put a lot of time into it yeah uh, the cd came out and at the time my son was um let's see scotty was oh he was he was two and a half when it started so he was three and a half when it ended and um <laughs> and when i had my cd concert which you have to have a cd release concert right. And um, so obviously I had the PR skills by that time to do it. And um, I just remember uh, really obsessing over whether I should have my son Scotty there because I adored him and he should be part of this big event and all. And, and I was wondering how we could manage it. And my friend, you know, a friend turned to me and said, are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> now he's going to run up to the stage and completely, you know, interrupt the whole thing and, you know, want you to pick him up. No, you can't do that. So, um, so yeah, so Scott stayed home. But, yeah. um, so I did the motherhood and, and making a CD for 11 and a half months and then went back to motherhood and, and PR. How many kids did you have? One. Um, Just him. Yep. Yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. Well, I it works for me. <laughs> yeah, one is good. Uh, yeah, he gets um, he gets a lot of attention, and he actually said to me the other day, he goes, "I'm really glad you didn't have any more." And I said, "Why?" And he goes, "I really enjoyed all the attention. I would hate to have you know had to share it." <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. That's true. Good. Well, that's good. Yeah. Well, it's uh, my mine's ten, so he'll be saying that. In eight years or so. But. Yeah. Yeah, I know yours is 10. I really envy you. It's, it's just such a fun time. Yeah. It really is. It is. Yeah. So um, you you do uh, songs on piano, but occasionally you do them on guitar as well. Uh, are there any, yes. Are there any other instruments you play? Nope. That's it. I, I, I do want to take up harmonica, but I'm not going to probably write songs for harmonica <laughs> well you um, never know <laughs> but yeah just those two and, uh, and i don't even have a lot of guitars like there's so many people at the hearing room who you can see all their guitars on the back wall and i think wow you know and i i only have two but yeah yeah i don't have a ton i think i have three that really work the others mm -hmm. are guitars that ceased working at some point oh okay um, like i got an a, an acoustic a 12 string and a classical i figure that oh well yeah right that runs that covers, the gamut that covers the bass i love 12 strings oh my gosh yeah actually i think the harmonica might have to wait i th i think i would love to learn how to play 12 string is it well, much harder it's the same thing it's just you could press harder <laughs> and yeah. your fingers have to get used to the grooves because uh, they're they're a little different, but if you've already built calluses, then it's it's definitely the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a matter of how much pressure you're putting on it, and it also depends what kind of guitar you get. You know, if you get one with really low action, that's good too. Yeah, um, right. And you right. won't have to struggle as much. My guitar is sort of a a, a consumer model. It's a Takamine. But, um, oh yeah, it's a nice guitar, but it's, you know, it's old. It needs work. <laughs> they always oh, need work. I, yeah. yeah. But, um. So why don't we take a quick break here? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, if you want to do more piano, you can stay at the piano, or we, you can move to the other room while I'm talking. And uh, what I wanted to talk about was the hearing room and updating everybody on what's going on there. So the hearing room is undergoing a change because we have, since the last podcast, closed the physical location of the hearing room. We have uh, decided that that's the best way to deal with the fact we can't be open right now for public. Uh, so we are going to be opening a new location and we're looking for it right now if anybody wants to get involved you are welcome to come and give us your opinion and help us find a new place uh, but we are still doing a lot of things online so we have zoom events uh, regularly i do an open mic every sunday 
there is an open mic on Tuesdays as well. Both of them are pretty well attended. And then there is a uh, Let's Have Words, which is the spoken word evening on Wednesdays. Uh, Thursdays, it, it's been up and down because they we tried to do jamming on Zoom and it didn't work that well. But now we've got this new possibility and they're looking at new different types of software where they could actually do the jam online. So that is an exciting thing that's coming up. And you can check out all these events on our website, hearingroom.net. Some of the other things we are doing is we're doing events that are themed. So, for example, we do a Beatles night where everybody comes and it's sort of like an open mic, but just you're limited to the Beatles or you're limited to Bruce Springsteen or Pink Floyd or whatever you you know, that night is. So there's a lot of that stuff going on. And if you want to check it out, hearingroom.net, we have a new page. So we have updated it. We have improved the uh, usability and the design. And uh, we use Jason Campbell. If anybody wants a website design, Jason's a good one to do it. So you can check that out. Now, uh, I also want to thank, again, the Greenville Junction Shop. That's Greenville, G-R-E-E-N-V-I-L-L-E, Junction, J-U-N-K-T-I-O-N-S-H-O-P-P-E. The Greenville Junction Shop is a secondhand shop, but they are used items, and they are like new. There are very exciting things there. They have furniture. They have household appliances, they have electronics, anything and everything. So you should check them out. They have a store that's going to be opening up in Greenville, New Hampshire. It might be a hike for you, but it's also a nice day trip. And you can check that out and see what Greenville, New Hampshire is like and get some good stuff at the Junction Shop. There is also uh, stuff that they will do in, in terms of cleaning out apartments so if you wanted to do some consignment and or you wanted to give away some old stuff you didn't need they come over and they will bring a truck and check it out and take it away for you so it's the greenville junction shop greenville j u n k t i o n s h o p p e the greenville junction shop is also on Facebook, and you can check them out with that name, Greenville Junction Shop. So be sure to look into that. And uh, Mark A. Bear is the one you should talk to, and he has lots of options for you. So uh, that being said, we're speaking today with Pamela Steinfeld. So let's uh, continue our conversation. So what's your uh, musical background? Do you, did you ever get training other than you said you t took piano when you were little, but did you ever do anything later, like take classes in college or um, play piano with a teacher or anything like that? Um, the, only, the only thing I did when I was about 29 um, and living in D.C., I took a year of comp it was a combination of um, regular piano lessons and and composition and um, I really felt that the earlier training just jumped jumped up to greet you know my new my new instruction and um, so I you know I really benefited from that but but mainly it's been on my own. With regard to guitar, um, I think I took a year with, about a year, yeah, with a local, you know, local song leader uh, when I was about 14. And other than that, I've really just been doing it on my own. Okay. Um, what do you enjoy most about uh, playing? Uh, it, it, it feels enormously fulfilling, probably because whether I'm I'm playing and singing my songs or somebody else's song, 
I think you can create a real um, meaningful three or four minutes there that you know that it, that captures an emotion or a situation or thoughts that we all have. So for me, it's it's really creating it's creating something that binds us all to one another. I think you know common experiences. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, you uh, you mentioned that your influencers are like Carly Simon, James Taylor, Joni Mitchell, um, mm-hmm. but you have a little bit of a rock edge occasionally. So like folk rock. <laughs> Do you have any of those like rock um, influences as well? Well, I adore Springsteen. Okay, well there you go. So, yeah, yeah, I do adore Springsteen. Um, yeah, I, I mean, growing up, I loved um, the Rolling Stones, Deep Purple. Um, yeah, I, I really liked rock as well. Yeah, did you ever yeah. get into heavy metal other than Deep Purple? <laughs> No. no, I mean, I was in I was in a couple of high school bands where we would do where we do rock songs, and I would just sing back up. But I didn't create any rock music. Yeah. Is it you were in a rock band in high school? Or indeed, later? yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you didn't want to continue that way. No, because again, the writing is, is just so much more rewarding. Mm-hmm. and meaningful to me than the performing yeah plus you have yeah. to get along with the band and yeah and i hear that's very difficult yeah, as it well. can be <laughs> yeah. how about you have you been in bands uh not really i've been in bands that were me with a, with side people mm-hmm. um i typically did that um i did have a band once um that did jewish events Mm. So mm-hmm. we did like uh, usually community wide things, and we'd play a couple songs and do that kind of thing, but nothing that we wrote, um, mm-hmm. just yeah. different traditional stuff. But that was my band experience. Everything else, I was pretty much solo, or, solo, yeah, or yeah. or a duet or just with mm-hmm. a few other people. But, I mean, I think I think duos are really fun. Yeah. Because you can get harmonies in there, and it, it's just fun to be up there with another person. Mm-hmm. Well, it's somebody to bounce off of. You know, that helps. I know a mm-hmm. lot of people who do that now. You know, they're doing a a couple thing. They're married in real life, and they become a, a group. <gasps> oh, in real, yeah. Yeah, you know. right. I, I, I know two of whom you're, you're speaking. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, there's Dan and Faith, and uh, there's the Lied Twos, and oh, Sweet, right. yeah, Sweet Wednesday. Um, I don't know if you know them. They're married. Uh, I, I don't. The Lied Twos are married? They're not married, but they're okay. together. Uh, there's Folkopotamus. Um, and oh, I don't know them. They're great, uh, and they're married. And uh, there's Crow's Pasture, same thing. Hmm. So there's quite a few around uh, duos who became duos and are really duos in real life. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, that, that must be great, especially during COVID, because you can still practice with your band. You know? Right, that's true. <laughs> um, although the Lied Twos had to distance for a while because they weren't uh, sure. But Yeah, and they, they're very good. They live in different places. So. Oh, okay. But, yeah. um, but there's other stuff, uh, you know, that lots of people locally are, are doing with, with small groups like that, you know, and... Um, but I think, uh, there's something to be said for doing solo. It's a lot cheaper, a lot easier to travel. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and uh, you don't have to, um, well, you don't have to compromise, you know, right. on, on, especially in the songwriting area. Um, you know, if you want your lyric, you win, you know, you mm-hmm. get it. And, uh, so what you got your guitar in your arms, uh, yep. what do you, uh, you want to do something on the guitar? Sure. Yep, this song's called Each and Every Dream. It's actually the first song on my CD. And um, we, it's, uh, I, I, I never think you should give a real introduction. I think you should just let people listen and get meaning, whatever meaning they want out of it. So. Okay, so we'll call this The Mystery. 
<laughs> okay. Each and every dream. The mystery. I would love to look you in the eye I would love to be around behind I would love to sneak across your border I would love to find the key to you I would love to see the hidden view I would love to make it my water song <laughs> yeah. uh, I like it um, thank you more of a Bruce Springsteen approach you know wow yeah. I have never been compared to Bruce Springsteen this is a big day thank okay. you <laughs> what Carly Simon wasn't good enough for you no not next no. to Bruce okay. no, Br- Br- Bruce is the man yeah. I understand <laughs> um, so uh, what is your son doing uh, is how old is he? He's twenty two mm-hmm. and he's in his last year of college and he is a game programming major. That's smart. So he's um <laughs> well, you know, the funny thing is, I mean, luckily there's a market for it because that's always been his strength. Um I mean I love to tell the story about when he was like two or three. I you know, I get forget developmental stages, but um I remember um, his dad and I were teaching him how to play Chinese checkers and you know it's pretty pretty basic right okay mm-hmm. we can maybe he can maybe he can actually play this game and so we explained it all to him and he said um, well 
how about, and it was always, how about, how about instead of that, why don't we make the purple marbles kings and they can only go sideways and the blue ones would be queens. And when they get to the yellow spaces, they have double the value. <laughs> So you he's know, the, trying to come up with a complex, more complex game yeah, for himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, he was smarter than his parents. And, and so, you know, at the time we were like, oh, my God, can we just play the game? But but, but he did that frequently, and it's just the way his mind works. You know, he's coming up with creative alternatives. Yeah, it's like, uh, you know, the role-playing games people do. They're very complicated games. Oh. Um, I wonder if he ever tried those. Uh, is that like the um, like, Dungeons and Dragons? Yeah, he like didn't that do that. Yeah, he didn't do that. Well, because there were video games to do, so they they uh, stopped doing those as much when the video games came. But there, a lot of people still doing them. He might like those. Is that you know like all imagination? Like there's no there's no video, there's no board game, that kind of thing. Well, it's yeah, it's basically a a story you're telling and. Uh, you have some rules, like how you do combat and how you do different things in the game, like mm -hmm. what what your character can be and things like that. But, uh, yeah, it's a fun way to do it, and he's already into that, so it makes sense. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask him, because I, I once said to him you know, that I'd heard of Dungeons & Dragons. He said, yeah, I don't like that. Well, but he did like Pokemon a lot, which sounds like it has similar qualities, that each character has different abilities, different limitations, different modes of attack, that sort of, well, that sort of thing. The role-playing games that are offline are, are really hard to get into unless you like math and figuring oh, really? stuff out. I mean, you don't really need heavy math, but you need, you know, you need to, to know that... You know, a twelve-sided die is what you use for this weapon, as opposed to a different weapon, and it's hmm. you know stuff like that. So, oh, that's interesting. But does he program uh, professionally yet at all, or is he just not? In school? I mean, he, he's just in school, but he's been he's been creating games since his teens. You know, at home, mm -hmm. um, I don't I don't understand most of it. Um, but, but he has created games and there's, there's one that he did in school that is available to play. Really? You know, it was for, it's for free, but I don't remember the name of it. Um, so yeah, he's been creating games for a number of years now and this is his last year and, and, uh, hopefully he'll be in the private sector soon. That would be good. Yeah. And maybe, uh, get some really big games out there. You never know. Yeah, who knows? It's certainly big business. It, it is. He really enjoys it, which is awesome. I had to find somebody you love. I once heard somebody uh, at the hearing room who she had a one of her credentials was uh, video game music. So oh. you know that's a specialty too. People people composing like the soundtrack of a video game uh, for some of the big games. That's you mm -hmm. know they actually sell it. <laughs> You know, he he actually does that as well um, oh, at good. school. He does the programming and the sound on, on the projects. Um, so yeah, yeah. Let's I see. mean, it's definitely an art, you know, because some of the those old eighties games like Mario, where you had to hear the song over and over and over and over. <gasps> oh, it, that's right. It oh, had to be right. You know, it had to be pretty catchy. Otherwise, you'd just get annoyed. Yeah, because some yeah. of the ones with bad music were terrible to play because you had to listen to the awful song every time. But you know, that would be interesting to find out. You know, like whether yeah. the ones that had difficult music to listen to um, were less successful than the ones with pleasant melodies. Yeah, well, not necessarily pleasant. Just the they spent more time on it, I guess, and they're n not necessarily pleasant, just catchy. Um, oh, you know, okay. They had right, a, right, right. They had a hook and a theme. You know, yep, that's yep. usually what makes it sound good. But uh, that's cool that he's doing that. Um, yeah. And is he in town, like locally, or no? No, he's in Vermont. Oh yeah. Yeah. So nice place to be. It is a very <laughs> nice. 
it is so nice that uh, when I went up there to visit him one time, and it was freezing, just utterly freezing and snowing and, you know, true L.L. Bean weather. <laughs> right. Um, and, and I was not dressed for the occasion. That's why I was freezing. But I remember going, it's still gorgeous. There's no way around it. This place is gorgeous. Yeah. So, I, we yeah. spent uh, our honeymoon there. Oh. Um, we, we went up to a ski resort in the summer. Uh-huh. Um, and it was great. It was really nice. It was um, oh, that's lovely. not that many people. And it was a really nice ski resort. You know, even wow. with no people, it's a nice place to stay. And, uh, uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. You know, and they have the summer version of the ski stuff where you you go down the slope on a go-kart sled thing. They oh, have how fun. On concrete. <laughs> so, not oh, sure on how... concrete? Yeah, well, it's a track. They You, oh. you go down the mountain on this track. Oh, so, wow. um, they do that in Vermont and also... Uh, and also, they have a lot of mosquitoes. <laughs> yes, actually. I worked at a summer camp. I... I was a music counselor for a number of years, and one was in Vermont, and I was eaten alive. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. But, yeah, it's a, it's a nice area to go. Um, yeah. And is he, he's a senior now? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, he's looking he at is. graduation. He is. He is. Um, luckily, he was able to go back, you know, and actually be there this during this whole mess yeah. um, for senior year. Although, you know, he came home in March when, mm. when before anybody knew how to handle the virus, of course. And um, But he does all his classes remotely. So he's in his room, you know, and he's got three roommates in his suite, and that's his little world. Right, and, you know, with that kind of a, a, a major... It's easy to do it remotely. Right. It's all programming, right? So exactly, exactly. Um, yep. You know, it it's built for it, right? Um, but uh, did you uh, ever write songs about your your family, your kids? Your kid? Um, I well, I have. Well, the short answer is yes. So, I have hundreds of. Um, sets of lyrics that are waiting for music so obviously lyrics come more easily to me and um, yeah a number of them are about uh, family situations family members my grandmothers um, but I don't have music for them yet and I, I you know I'd like to put music to all of them and, and we'll get to it mm-hmm. there, and, I, and I didn't write one about my son until uh, he was about 19 because I, I couldn't, I couldn't even begin, you know, to say what he meant to me, what he means right. to me. So, yeah. it, does your, is your family still around in New Jersey? Yep, they're in Jersey. My one sister is in Philly. Um, my folks are in Jersey, and the other sister is in New York. Cool. So yeah, yeah. All right. Well, you got another song you want to do? Sure, I could I could do the song I wrote very quickly when um, when I found out that um, my little family was able to move back to Boston from Washington, and I was so excited. And it was called it's called Find Find My Way Home. Okay. <laughs> Breathe in the phone 
It's got a good uh, coming back home feel to it. Oh, uh, good. It, it, good. It sounds like that. It fits. Um, Excellent. You got another one? I can play another one. Right. Sure. Okay, this song is called Boomerang. And um, true story. And um, of course, it's a love story. But. The rest will be a mystery. Okay. Um, 
You know, I was reading in your bio that you had a song called Sketching Marsha. Um, I do. Can you play that one? Is it... I, it said uh, in in the bio that somebody commented it was like a story song, and I, I kind of wanted to hear that because I'm a big fan of that type of song. Um, I don't have it prepared. I can okay. get it prepared, but I don't have it prepared um, right now. Okay. Sorry. Well, how about another one? <laughs> okay. Okay, I've got a story song for you. This is called The Girl. you know a song is done that that is a really good question um it it's funny um 
I think what I do is I have to like every, I have to like everything about it. Not that it, you know, it's a fabulous song or a perfect song or anything like that, but I just have to be comfortable with um, what's being conveyed lyrically as well as the musical accompaniment. Um, I'm actually in the middle of a song called um, Sometimes I Go to Scotland and I'm, I'm just trying different melodies with it to see what what is conveying the the lyrics of the song melodically um, and 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 it's funny because there are songs that I have just told myself this is done gosh darn it it's done and and I know that I don't like the bridge <laughs> Right. And so um, even though I put it in the finished pile, invariably I'll go back and, and rewrite the bridge. And I just did actually with a song. And, and now it's done. It truly is done because it's, um, it's captured what I wanted to capture um, in words and music. All right. Do you want to do yeah. one more song before we start closing it up? Sure. Um, yeah, I'll do a song called Would You Listen, which is also on my CD. It's, um, my CD is called Open Hands. Okay. And actually, you can hear the full-blown version of, well, 12 songs um, from my CD on YouTube. Oh. If you just put in my name, Pam Steinfeld. Yeah. You mean Pamela. So, well, you and I know it's Pamela, <laughs> but but YouTube does not. They they call me Pam. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this is what you listen. I still hear your voice 
Thank you. So, um, that was great. Uh, Thank you. Do you, uh, do you have any advice you give to uh, younger people or people who are starting in music and maybe want to make an album, maybe want to get into PR or any of those things? Do you, <laughs> do you have advice for them? Um, hmm. Well, um, if you're talking about how to find financial success, um, I do not have advice for the musicians. Um, I do have advice for the musicians on how to um, make songwriting and music a wonderful part of your life. And, and that is to, um, you know, learn the basics of theory, perhaps take an online course at Berkeley um, to learn the structure, typical structures of songs. Um, Pat Patterson offers a great lyrics course and has books on lyric writing. Um, and I took a fantastic melody writing course at Berkeley. So, um, and after all that, then you really must be true to yourself and write about things that are um, who you are. So, um, you know, I wouldn't be writing about what it's like to ride a horse in Texas. Um, wouldn't even have the first idea how to do it. You know, you write from your own experience. And then, um, number one, it's easier. Number one, it rings truer. And um, and you just do a better job because you, you know that, that those experiences. Um, so that is my advice in terms of making music a rewarding part of your life. I mean, the music industry has changed so dramatically. And... Um, it's extremely hard to get into. There are fewer income streams, number one, mm -hmm. because of the digital age. And it's, it's just nearly impossible. Um, if you know someone in the music business, by all means, you know, um, chat with them, see, if, see whether they can get your song to um, a well-regarded artist. But other than that, I mean, it's just... It's just very, very hard to do, and I, I don't actually recommend it um, anymore. It was different when I was trying this 20 years ago. Um, in terms of PR, <laughs> um, I, I would say get a master's in communications. I really would. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, I taught myself well, almost everything I know about PR, but um, it would have been more effective, more time efficient to have just gotten a master's in communications. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for doing this. Uh, it was nice to talk to you and listen to your, your music up close. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure. I really appreciate that, the opportunity to play and, and uh, just get to know one another a little bit better. Well, do you want to... Um, mention anything coming up where people can hear your music or see you you mentioned the cd they can get that anywhere or is there a specific um well if they want to buy the cd they should contact me okay and i can i can give you that email <laughs> okay okay so that would be pamela jane one so it's p-a-m-e-l-a-j-a-y N E one at gmail.com. Okay. And, uh, so we'll, we'll see you around the hearing room at least anyway. Absolutely. So people can yeah. always come and find you on a lot of our open mics. So that's, well, that's one. very true. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Just to go to the hearing room, uh, website. Cause I, I go to so many of your events cause they're so awesome. Yeah. Well, we think so. And, uh, uh, that leads me into my final segue, which is you should all go to the Hearing Room website, uh, hearingroom.net, to find out what's going on, both in person and online. We are, When we are able to meet in person again and have a place, it'll be announced there and it'll be announced on Facebook. But you can check out all our, our show information in both places as well. So please do that, and also please patronize the Greenville 
Junction Shop. That's J-U-N-K-T-I-O-N, Greenville Junction Shoppe, S-H-O-P-P-E, in Greenville, New Hampshire. And they will have a store opening very shortly. So keep your ears open on this podcast. I will announce more details. Uh, You can also check out their Facebook page. So we've been talking with Pamela Steinfeld, and you can check out her information on uh, online and on Facebook, right? Um, well, on you to hear the music, YouTube. YouTube, okay. So you can check that out on YouTube or email Pamela Jane One at gmail dot com. And everybody should have a great week. If you start with a dream and share it with some friends, the idea. Yeah.